What exactly is the U.S. up to in Venezuela? A New York Times report from 2018 claims that the Trump administration held secret meetings in 2017 with Venezuelan military officers to discuss their plans to overthrow President Nicolas Maduro. That would not have been the first time a U.S. administration has meddled in Venezuela's affairs. In fact, U.S. involvement in Venezuela dates back decades. Well, it's not new. As, as uh, um, the history record proves, the U.S. has sought regime change in Venezuela since the election of Hugo Chavez. This has been going on a long time. I think the main difference is that the Trump administration is much more aggressive about it and open about it. But you can't talk about U.S. intervention in Venezuela or even Latin America without mentioning a nearly 200-year-old policy called the Monroe Doctrine. To put it simply, it basically declared that the United States had a kind of supremacy in this hemisphere. Originally designed to block European powers claiming colonies in Latin America, the Monroe Doctrine was later interpreted to mean the U.S. also claimed the right to overrule the democratic process on the continent through invasions, coups, and CIA covert operations. The United States is an empire, and so if you're an empire, you want as many countries as possible to line up with you. And so the, the pawns matter uh, as well in, in a chess game. In 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry announced the end of the Monroe Doctrine. Many years ago, the United States dictated a policy that defined the hemisphere for many years after. We've moved past that era. But how true is that statement? It never ended. In terms of foreign policy, there is very little difference between liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans on the matter of exercise of U.S. foreign power in Latin America. We've had coups supported by Democrats and we've had coups supported by Republicans. Venezuela also checks another key box of reasons for U.S. intervention, oil. Venezuela's petroleum production reached an all-time high in 1970. A few years later, in 1976, the industry was nationalized. Venezuela has some of the largest deposits of oil in the world, and potentially that oil could be a great asset, as Mr. Bolton has said, uh, if American companies are able to exploit it. Venezuela was always seen as a very willing ally uh, and also as a constant supply of oil. But beyond oil, the U.S. was desperate to prevent this former ally from becoming a socialist state. Venezuela was the beginning of a radical political change in Latin America, beginning in 1998. Venezuela went from being the model democracy, the preferred option that the U.S. promoted in Latin America, a pacted democracy that always supported the U.S., to being its nemesis when the election of Hugo Chavez, who promoted regional integration, uh, national sovereignty, nationalism, and an alternative to the U.S. promotion of free trade and neoliberalism in Latin America. Hugo Chavez's election was particularly concerning for the U.S. He not only sought to use Venezuela's oil wealth to fund health care, education, and other benefits for the poor, but he also aligned with Cuba's Fidel Castro, Washington's longtime nemesis in Latin America. So in that sense, Venezuela becomes a thorn in the side of the U.S., and you add to that that the election of Chavez in Venezuela was quickly followed by Lula in Brazil, the uh, Kishners in Argentina, Correa in Ecuador, Morales in Bolivia, Bachelet in Chile. And you saw a change in the geopolitical uh, character in the landscape of Latin America. And that's threatened the U.S.'s hegemony. So that what's happening now in many cases is an effort to recoup that hegemony. And Venezuela is, is part of that effort to recover the U.S.'s control and power. In 2002, after 18 people were killed in an anti-government protest, Venezuelan military officers and opposition leaders staged a coup to overthrow President Chavez. U.S. government officials serving under George W. Bush at the time denied having any prior knowledge of the coup. While American officials said they would not support any extra-constitutional moves to oust Chavez... There were CIA documents that were made public that showed that the United States government had advanced knowledge of the coup. Intervention doesn't always rely on force. 
President Trump announced sanctions on Venezuela's state-run oil industry in an effort to press for change in the country. What we're focusing on today is disconnecting the illegitimate Maduro regime from the sources of its revenues. Well, I think that from the very beginning, the U.S. policy towards Venezuela has been one of isolating Venezuela. This was under the Bush, Obama, and now Trump administration. Venezuela depends on oil for about 95% of its export earnings. It takes oil profits, purchases food, brings it back to the country for sale. That means it can be easily intervened and can be easily up upended. So sanctions means that the country no longer can, on many levels, be able to utilize its foreign assets to buy food and bring it home. Sanctions also means it can't renegotiate its debt. Sanction also means it can't buy on the international market. After the death of Hugo Chavez in 2013, his former deputy Nicolas Maduro took power. Since then, Venezuela has been rocked by political, financial and humanitarian crises and ordinary Venezuelans are bearing the brunt of all of them. The country is facing hyperinflation, poverty, and food shortage. People are struggling to afford basic necessities, including medicine. Three million Venezuelans have fled to neighboring countries like Colombia and Brazil. While Maduro blames the U.S., critics, including many former supporters and officials of Hugo Chavez, blame corruption and poor governance. President Trump took advantage of the chaos and division in Venezuela to throw his support behind the self-declared interim president, Juan Guaido. Keep in mind that the U.S.'s involvement in Venezuela fits a long-term pattern of U.S. intervention in Latin American politics. So you have a long history of U.S. intervention in the region, and it's very anti-democratic, very often supported dictatorships. And in the 21st century, it was mostly against these left governments who were more interested in independence and self-determination than the prior governments that were close to the U.S. The Trump administration has now called on veteran foreign policy advisor Elliot Abrams to act as special envoy on Venezuela. Abrams certainly has experience in the region, but that experience has not necessarily been in promoting democracy. Throughout the 1980s, he was a key figure in organizing the Reagan administration's support for dictators and death squads in El Salvador, Guatemala, Panama, and Nicaragua. He pleaded guilty in 1991 to two counts of misdemeanor for withholding information from Congress about illegal U.S. funding for right-wing Nicaraguan paramilitaries, the Iran-Contra affair. The selection of Elliot Abrams shows that it's very similar to what they were doing in the 1980s when they were trying to overthrow the elected government of, of Nicaragua. And there was so much resistance to it, uh, by the way, in the United States that the Reagan administration had to end up funding the Contras illegally with uh, arms sales to Iran. This is the neocons like uh, John Bolton coming back and just trying to do the same thing all over again. Whatever the intentions of the United States, the opposition to Maduro is growing and popular. Years of economic mismanagement, corruption, and authoritarian repression of the media and political opposition has drawn even many supporters of Hugo Chavez onto the streets to demand that the government step down. So is it possible to want change in Venezuela but oppose U.S. involvement in the country? I agree there needs to be change in Venezuela, but the Venezuelans have to decide that. It's a very slippery slope when we go down uh, having the U.S. become the arbiter of internal politics in any country.